Hi, everybody. Welcome back to SuperCloud 4. We're here live in our Palo Alto studio. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, Rob Stretch. Hey, Rob, we've been going all day. We're going we're gonna to continue tomorrow. We have so much demand for SuperCloud content. We decided to bleed into day two. Lior Gavish is here. He's the co-founder and CTO of Monte Carlo, a company focused on data and observability, and joined by Dave Linthicum of Deloitte. Uh, Dave just wrote a book, Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing, just surpassed 10,000 copies. Congratulations. Thank you. Get a copy on Amazon. And welcome, welcome to the, to the Cube Studios. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you guys for having us. So why'd you write this book? You, you've written a lot of books. Why this one? Uh, a lot of my clients were uh, telling me too that they really need to understand what the story is behind the story. In other words, what's, what are the secrets behind cloud computing? What works and what doesn't? And they seem to be getting a lot of that detail from communicating with lots of industry insiders, things like that. And I just figured I'd write a book on an insider's guide to cloud computing to reveal what, what's working out there, what's not, how to make investments, how to leverage technology like generative AI in an effective way, and also many chapters on how to build a super cloud and deploy that in your enterprise to save money and mitigate complexity. So it was a book I think needed to be written, so I wrote the book. And Leo, I mean, obviously you see all the data. David and I were talking earlier. It's like, cloud, it's less expensive. Cloud, it's more expensive. Yes, it's true, and it comes, it depends, right? I mean, it's not, there's no, it's horses for courses, as they like to say in Britain. But um, what's your perspective on all this evolution? And we're going to get into the AI piece, but the cloud is, is kind of mature now, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, from my perspective, I, 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 I'm struggling to think of a company that hasn't adopted the cloud, so I think the, the question is more, what's going into the cloud and what doesn't. There's a lot of factors that go into that decision, uh, cost being one of them, but also you know, agility and flexibility and, and the ability to scale. Uh, and so I see companies uh, you know, making those decisions and, and gradually getting, it, obviously getting workloads into the cloud. Yeah, so very few companies are not in the cloud. I mean, you're right, everybody's in the cloud. But at the same time, I think the vast majority, I, I, I think, only about 20% of the, the data that we have suggests that 20% that of the customers are all in on cloud. So it's a hybrid world, right? And you're seeing, I'm sure you talked about this in your book, but I'd love your perspectives on it. Maybe it's not an equilibrium per se, but it's more of a balanced approach. People sort of rethinking where to put stuff, right? Yeah, it used to be a very polarizing approach. People either all cloud and they were cloud only. You would come and get the edict there. Or they were never going to use a cloud. Uh, and depending on who you were talking to. And the reality is that they're finding that it is going to be a balanced approach. Some workloads and data sets reside, should reside in the cloud because they're going to be optimized for the cloud. Some should still reside on premise. Some should reside on edge computing. And really we're kind of getting this to, to this ubiquitous computing model. We're going to run everything everywhere and be able to find that processing and leverage it and leverage the data where it resides. So it's kind of coming to an agreement that there is no agreement as to that, the fact there's going to be a single cloud to use and your ability to leverage abstraction automation to mitigate that complexity because it's obviously going to get to a more complex environment is really where people are focused on right now. So they want to leverage the platform that has the most optimization for their workloads and for their data sets and do so in a very realistic way and do so in a way that's going to scale and do so in a way that's going to return the most value back to the business. It's as boring as that. Well, but so, but this, this to get to this simplicity, as you're saying, David, it's very complex. You love complexity, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Right, because that's what you guys do. How is AI changing the game generally? I know sort of a bromide, but, but how is it changing sort of how you approach the market? Um, for us, AI is a, is a huge accelerator, uh, and we're a, an observability company. We basically help uh, companies understand uh, the health and the reliability of their data systems. Um, from our perspective, uh, the, the promise of Gen AI is amazing, right? There's so much good stuff that enterprises can do with generative AI. Um, and I think the key to that is just uh, getting enterprise data integrated with AI, right? Uh, there's, uh, there's lots of problems that you can solve with, with public information. Uh, coding being one of them, right? Generative AI models are very good at generating code. Um, but if you think about a lot of the problems that uh, enterprises are trying to solve, either internally or for their customers, that's going to require access to proprietary data, right? It's not going to be solely based on information that's, that's been out there and that's been used to train those, uh, those foundation models, uh, which means that enterprises are going to be able to, or are going to need uh, to augment uh, AI with, with their internal data uh, through a RAG architecture, or uh, they're going to have to 
uh, fine-tune their models and basically uh, help the models become more knowledgeable about specific domains uh, that are relevant to, to the enterprise. Um, and for our, from our perspective, that's very exciting. Uh, we want to help companies enable that. Uh, these systems are pretty complex, and, 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 and whether you fine-tune or, or use RAG, uh, you're building a lot of data pipelines that are feeding information uh, from data that's found across the enterprise and into uh, you know, the, the, the customer-facing uh, application. Um, and Monte Carlo uh, is there for our customers to help them make those data pi pipelines work and, 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 and work reliably. Uh, and be trusted because uh, you know the adoption of AI um, is is you know you have to make these things trusted and and, and reliable right and the the first year of AI was about hallucinations and and all kinds of issues that emerged with AI and 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 and, and we're there to to help mitigate some of these things and make them uh, more powerful for the enterprise and I, I think that I think you just hit on a, a really powerful point it's the transparency and it's the as you build data products on top of all of this data be it an AI based product or other uh, analytics based product or ML based product as the case may be it's really about where did the data come from its lineage the quality of that data how do I get to it because I, I think you guys had a uh, blog a couple weeks ago on different use cases and the one I like to use is, hey, my finance team is looking to build an LLM to basically build their 10 Qs every quarter. Mm -hmm. And it's on a very, it, it's very structured, it's very fixed. I know what data needs to come in there. I know how to go and build it. That seems like a couple of use cases. What are you both seeing as the, like the starting use case where people are really inserting themselves here? I, I think it's a matter of solving operational problems. In other words, things they couldn't automate. We're getting to that last bastion of automation. That's what digital transformation was all about. And there was about 20 to 30% of the processes that we just can't digitize. We just can't automate it. But they're kind of busy work. They're able to be repeatable, but they do need certain amount of expertise and knowledge that, go, that is able to, to run those things. So if we're able to automate that last mile, then I think we're eliminating a lot of the inefficiencies that are in the existing manual systems right now. And so it's the fact that they're looking at those processes as something that they can automate, whether it's a sales automation system, the ability to automate a factory floor, ability to automate supply chain. A lot of stuff is still done manually, and those things are ripe to be automated with generative AI and other AI systems for that matter. So who gets disrupted? Um, don't, uh, don't even answer that. <laughs> a bit more specific question. <laughs> Take something like RPA. If you're a, if you are a, a, a point product in RPA, I would think that you would want to sell the company or, or, or move on or you know, and find a, a new path, as an example. It's like being a, 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 a storage admin back in the day, right? Doing LUNs. But so that's an example where there was a, a reasonably heavy lift to put in RPA, and now Gen AI can, can do a lot of that stuff. Are you seeing a lot of examples you know, like that? And what does that mean for organizations in terms of what they do with their processes, how they reskill? I mean, this is a, a big complicated question for a lot of companies. Um, how do they go about doing that? Um, so, uh, unfortunately, there You're aren't deferring. a lot. <laughs> oh, was that to me? No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. No, please. No, please. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you're absolutely right. The, the job changes quite a bit, right? In the same way that if you used to be a database administrator with the advent of Snowflake, you, you had to go and do other things. Uh, it's, it's the same thing right now, uh, even with coding, like generative AI is making that a lot easier and, and a lot of other tasks a lot easier. Um, and uh, the, the, the bad news is that there's no one out there that knows how to do this, right? Like there's very few people out there with experience of how to use Gen AI to do X or Y. Um, but that's also the opportunity, it's right? It's good news in a way, right? Right, it's good news. Uh, it, you know, we all have to learn and adapt it to our own lives, right? And some of the early use cases that we've seen extremely successful are around, uh, again, coding or uh, content creation, right? We've, we've seen a bunch of success with that. Um, and there's a lot more coming. Um, and, and, and I think it's the tip of the iceberg. Of the iceberg. And I think that, I, again, so far we've seen mostly foundation models doing very basic manipulation of public information. Not very basic, but pub mostly public information. The next generation is uh, 
those models being informed and knowledgeable about the enterprise's own data and kind of unlocking um, unstructured data for the enterprise, right? So far, if you're an enterprise that's using data, you're mostly using structured information and you're mostly using uh, tabular information. And now you can suddenly look into textual data, images, videos, um, voice, uh, and analyze it and, and use it in ways that, that haven't been done before. And yes, you need to learn a new skill set and uh, whether it's prompt engineering or how to build rag architectures uh, or how to fine tune models. Um, um, and, and people have to learn that. Uh, most of the enterprises that I've seen so far uh, basically take a tiger team, a small team. It's usually uh, someone reporting into the CTO or, or whatnot. And uh, they basically brainstorm you know, 70 or 150 or whatever different ideas of how that particular company can use generative AI. And then they go ahead and, and try to prototype and, and implement some of these things and, and create proof of concept uh, that then sometimes get handed off to, uh, to, to teams uh, in the company that go and, and productize it and, and implement it in, in customer facing. I'd like products. to pick your guys' brain on, on sort of the intersection of cloud and AI again. And Andrew, I wonder if we could cue the, the, the power law. We kind of took liberties with the you know, concept of power laws. But, but basically the idea being the vertical axis when we bring it up is, is size of model, the horizontal axis is model specificity and it's a long tail. And you know, you've got open source and third party models pulling the torso up. So the, one of the things we, you, you hear a lot of the tagline, we're going to bring the AI to the data. Well, the data is everywhere. The data is in the cloud, the data is on-prem, the data is at the edge. So here's my question. It, are, is the on-prem sort of experience enough cloud-like today where that sort of abstraction layer exists? Will they have the tools, you know, the, the innovation that the cloud guys have? And then what about the sort of edge, that, that really long tail? How will that sort of play out? Will they be, is, will it be yet another silo? Will they be interconnected? What's your vision on that, David? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think the reality is that the on-premise systems that we have available to us now may have more value. Yeah, excuse me, if you could bring that up. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt, David, but yeah, bring that up. So you can see here, I won't go into it too deeply, but, but it's that middle part with that specialized AI, that's right. the model specificity. And then the edge, you, you started to address that. There's governance issues, there's IP leakage concerns. Um, you know, the consumers are driving the big the models up on the left, the Googles, the Amazons, the NVIDIA, from gaming actually was a lot of their heritage. Uh, open AI, of course, with ChatGPT, but then lots of opportunities. And this is not, is not meant to represent the dollar opportunity. I think the dollars could be much, much bigger in the long tail. So uh, I apologize for the interruption, but back to sort of that, that question. Yeah, I think that's a great chart. Um, and ultimately, if we are going to deal with specialized AI that's localized for us within the business, there may not be a reason to store it in the cloud unless there's some financial benefit or optimization benefit of doing that. In many instances, that's not going to be there. The price of hardware uh, on, within data centers has dropped tremendously in the last 10 years. And so that's a very compelling reason to keep a lot of stuff on premise. So unless there's a compelling reason to put the stuff in the cloud, then that's where it's going to reside. Edge systems as well, the ability to put something within a ro uh, robot system because we were looking for the AI, that's closest to where the data is going, going to get gathered and that's an intelligent edge-based system. That may be the benefit of platform moving forward. Just like we said a few while ago, we're moving to this ubiquitous computing model where everything's not going to be in one platform. It's not always going to be, it's not going to be the edge, it's not going to be all on premise. You know, it's going to be on my wristwatch, mobile phone, cars, you know, all these sorts of things. We've got to be able to leverage it where it exists. And I think that AI is going to be much the same thing. We don't have to run it within a cloud environment. We can run it on premise. We can run it in the cloud. We can run it at the edge. And it can be very effective. Again, it's the, it's the, uh, what, it, it's what if. In other words, what does it need to do? What's the purpose of it? And then creating a bespoke, um, highly optimized solution to make it happen. Yeah, are, are you seeing this in your customers and in, in where they're storing their data? Because I mean, that's what you do, right? Is yeah. how to help them build those products. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take the opposing perspective. I'm going to argue that a lot of AI is actually going to happen on the cloud because of the because of economies of scale, right? Uh, there's just no way that any individual company uh, can run something that's as advanced uh, and as scalable uh, and, and as flexible 
uh, as an Azure or an AWS or a GCP or, uh, or, or an OpenAI can. These are people that, uh, you know, they have armies of engineers and operations people that, that think about this problem day in and day out. It's going to be hard for, uh, for, for any enterprise to do that. Um, and some people will for good reason, right? I don't know, the, the Department of Defense is probably not going to run uh, its generative AI models on, on, uh, on, on public cloud, but, uh, but you're going to have to have a really, really good reason of why you're going on-prem and, and, and you know, for us, for the vast majority of Well, let's debate this a little bit because you can make a case, all the innovations happening in the cloud, they got optionality of LLMs and it, they're, they got startups coming in and Google's making some, some, some big moves. Okay, it's alluring. The flip side of that is people are concerned about IP leakage and you're not going to run a Tesla inference in the cloud, right? So the edge is going to be, you know, very clearly real-time inferencing at the edge is going to be done on ARM processors, not likely in the cloud. Maybe they'll move the cloud to the, to the edge, but, but any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, he, he's right. There's a reason, a compelling reason to leverage the cloud. And I'm not saying we're, we're going to disallow moving into the cloud. That's always going to be a good option, but we have to do the analysis to figure out if it's optimized for the particular workload that LLM that's going to run, run in the particular system. In many instances, it's going to be contraindicated to run in the cloud because we're able to get more value out of, a lot more value in some instances, out of running it in a, uh, in a single private data center for some reason. Re there has to be a reason to do that. You have to have compelling reason. I get it, you have all this other stuff that's co-located with the cloud, that's a reason you put AI systems in the cloud. That's where the majority of the times that I put AI systems, it's in the cloud. But the reality is we have to consider all of these assets at our disposal and we have to look at the optimization of these solutions and their ability to bring the most value back to the business. That's the metric. And I think in many instances we're missing that. And so some people are just moving things automatically to whatever they think the platform is that everybody is moving to or the cool kids are moving to. And that's absolutely the wrong choice. And we're going to end up having to push those things back, repatriation in many instances, put them back in the platforms where we're able to provide the most value because we made the mistake of putting them on a platform there where it wasn't optimized for that particular workload, that particular low lamb, that particular data set. Yeah. I mean, but this I, is obviously good news for the cloud guys, right? Yeah. They're going to get a tailwind there. And I'd say it's good news for ARM is they're going to kick ass in the, in the edge. But when you, when you listen to, like I was at the Dell financial analyst meeting and listened to the H, HPE one, they're presenting it as, hey, this is great news for us too, right? So is it a rising, is it a tide that lifts all shit? Well, I, I think it is. And I, I think it's in between what you both have said, right? And I, I think it's an exact thing is that Things going to be able to run on CPUs. It's not like you're going to have to have all GPUs. And some CPUs are going to have coprocessors that are GPU-driven type co. And NPUs and yeah, accelerators. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think we'll, lots you'll have a lot of specialization, especially for inference. Because to your point, I think inference at the edge is where it makes sense. Co-located with the people who, or the data, machine data that's actually doing it to go and make those decisions. If you're running a factory and your factory becomes disconnected from the internet or disconnected from your cloud, you don't want that factory to stop if your machines are running and using inference to do that. And I think where the models get trained and you need 10,000 GPUs to go train the model makes a lot of sense to go to the cloud and do it up there. I think it becomes the economies of scale. Maybe. And, well, and what size model? But because doesn't OpenAI run run a lot of, of its training in a data center in Ohio because it's too damn expensive to do in the cloud? I, I, would say I, that, I don't know if that's true, I, I would read say it somewhere. They, <laughs> they do it in a lot Maybe of different places with their, with their you know, addition of the money that they got out of Azure and the credits and stuff like that. I would say that you know, there's a lot happening okay. in, in Iowa. As a or like Andy fact. was saying, was it Iowa? Andy yeah. was saying that uh, the, some of the specialized uh, 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 cloud players like CoreWeave and others yeah. are sort of gaining. So I, I, think, I think again, it's, it, there's going to be, it's, it's a cloud operating model where you, I think this is where you get to, where you're going to have it all over the place and you're going to need to have DevOps or platform engineering be able to connect all of these things together. Because I think the data, sometimes you're going to read data from one cloud to another cloud. I had customers at a previous company that they were collecting all their data into their data warehouse and their data lake inside of AWS and then they were cutting that data and transforming it and putting it into BigQuery in, in Google. And it was costing a phenomenal amount of money to move the data out of Amazon into that, but sure. they had certain reasons that made cost sense to go and do that on BigQuery because they had built out this AI system on top of BigQuery. And BigQuery's awesome and it served its needs, oh. but so. And this you, will get better. Uh, I mean, uh, NVIDIA is building a layer that would basically abstract away the 
the cloud vendors. Yeah, they wanted to right? do it in Amazon. Amazon said no, right? Is that? that well, they <laughs> did it anyways, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. now you can touch an API and right. run it on whether you want to run it on Amazon or on Oracle. Right. Um, do you care where the data is? Um, Would you prefer no. it to be in the cloud or it doesn't matter to you? It can be in the edge, it can be on-prem? Um, from our perspective, um, we are where our customers are, uh, which is primarily on the cloud. Right. Uh, and so we focus on the cloud as well. We obviously care a lot about where the data is because we build deep integrations and we deeply understand the systems that we're helping our customers monitor and, and observe. Um, but ultimately we build what our customers use and so where they are is, is where we build. Is that, is that on-prem experience though, that cloud operating model experience, is it close enough, David, to the cloud today? Because you talk to guys um, like Adam Salipsky and he says, that's not cloud, you know, we're cloud. You know, he makes that, that statement. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but of course, when you talk to the folks that have heritage and on-prem, they say, no, it's a cloud operating model and we can basically do what the cloud guys do. What's, what's the truth? It can be if you do the right things with having the right tools and technology on the on-premise system to make it seem like the cloud. And certainly there are private clouds you can leverage as well. And those are, by the way, making a comeback now. Uh, however, um, there's reasons to move it into a public cloud provider because of the co-locations of all the other IP and services that they have there. And he's absolutely right. They're going to have a better uptime record. They're going to have a better uh, ability to do that and maintain it over time. But the reality is it's how much does that, how much does that, uh, it, does that mean to you? Does it mean $20 million a year? And that's when people suddenly love this operating model and able to yeah. you know, figure out how to make Good it enough. work. Right? <laughs> and, and I think that's what we're coming down to. So a lot of these people are making very tough decisions about where these things should run and it really kind of comes down to money. We did an inordinately bad job in the last 10 years and optimizing workloads on the cloud. And so people got these huge cloud bills in 2022 was one research paper after another, how much more expensive this is than we thought it is. And people are responding to that. They're looking for other alternatives that can not get them into this financial dire straits that they got into, you know, by moving very quickly to the, into the cloud in the pandemic. You know, there was a study, ETR did it last summer. Yeah, remember you saw this data on which component of your cloud bill is most concerning. And the answer surprised me, it was database, mm -hmm. right? It, it, I thought it would be compute. I look at our cloud bill, it's all, it's all compute, a little bit of storage in there, but it was database. And I wonder, maybe it was a heavy snowflake influence because they bundle it in, I'm really not sure, but, but, it, but, but it surprised me because of the revenue flow you think is mostly compute. Yeah, no, I, I think it has to do with a lot of the different pieces in that stack that come together that are abstracted because they still have to pay the compute bill for those databases. They have the networking bill. They have all of the different bills and that right. when you start to see that layer cake built up, it becomes very expensive. But to your, to your point, I think people look at it and go, there's open source technologies and there's data mesh technologies that I can now deploy that kind of give me a cloud-like data platform as well that can stretch on-prem and you know, on the cloud. And maybe that's good enough to bring certain data together because the data at the end of the day has weight. It has gravity, it wants to sit where it is and making copies. And I think a big piece of that database being the most expensive is the fact that they're doing transformations and when they do the yeah. transformations, they're not really being efficient in how they transform. It. And it's they driving a lot of data. compute. Yes, and it drives <laughs> a lot of compute and it stores a lot more data. And I think AI is one of those things that unintended consequences of AI is way more data is the output from that. And then what do you do with all that data? Because again, that's going to factor into, do I keep it on premise or do I move it back on premise once it's trained to consolidate some of that cost or is it cheap enough in the cloud to this take is that. the way more data is like music to your ear. We love it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think you're right, and, but, but I think things are going to balance out a little bit. Um, you know, in the uh, until 2022, 2023, we're in a growth cycle, and everybody just built and built and built for growth, and nobody really looked at the build too much. Uh, and then the economy changed, and we all started taking a closer look at our bills and. Um, and you know, one alternative is to go off the cloud, go to private cloud or, or change the infrastructure that you run on. But what we also see companies doing is uh, optimize the workloads, right? Like there's many years of workloads that have been built, not necessarily with an eye to efficiency or, or optimization. Uh, and this can be optimized. And the cloud vendors are not oblivious to this either. They are uh, taking proactive measures to help customers reduce cost and changing their pricing. 
Uh, we're helping our customers. Observability is a big part in, in optimization, right? We've, we've helped our customers uh, reduce their, their Snowflake and Databricks bill quite a bit. Um, and so I, th I, I, I think we'll see things kind of evening out as the macroeconomics force companies to take a closer look at how, how they use data and how they spend money. And uh, we're all for it. Uh, it's it's going to make everybody. But better. you're right. That's a good point. We kind of forget things have been so AI crazy. The first half of 2023, there was a and in, in, in the second half of or the fourth quarter of 2022, a lot of optimizations. Actually, Amazon and others have been at that for a long, long time. Which the bet is, hey, if we can optimize, we can keep them there, right? And the, and so uh, so so that it's going to be interesting to see. Amazon announces earnings tonight after the close, about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I don't think you're going to see a big uptick just quite yet from AI, but I think in Q4 we might start to see that. And if we don't, you know, then I think people are going to start to get a little bit concerned and say, okay, show me the money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think right now it's uh, anybody's game. People are implementing at their own speeds. There's a lot of talk about AI going on as far as what's actually happening in terms of consuming cloud cycles and database cycles in the cloud, that kind of remains to be seen. Right now, I think there's a lot of experimentation going on. There's pr proof of concept prototypes. Uh, people normally aren't getting as far as people think based on the hype that we see you know, out in the press. And so I would push them to say, let's go a little slower to go faster and let's, let's make sure we're making the right decisions about where to platform this stuff and where to, where to, where to make the bets. My big concern right now is that people are building are building systems using generative AI that should not be built using generative AI. And I saw this you know, throughout my career in the early days of AI, and that's why it became too expensive and that was kind of pushed off for a while, things like that. We're having the same sort of thing now. We can do everything with this technology, it can add value on it. It certainly can add value, but again, how much is it worth to you? you know? And your ability to put resources and invest them into certain uh, things and innovative uh, bets and investment you need to make in your company have to be completely strategic now. You, we can't make that many mistakes. You're going to make a mistake and find yourself outside the market. Yeah, it really comes back to that business case. It's something that I'm sure you spend a lot of time doing. Guys, thanks so much for coming on SuperCloud 4. Really appreciate it. Okay, up next, Jeff Boudreau was just named the Chief AI Officer at Dell. Dell's is nearly a $100 billion company and um, they don't have a Chief Data Officer. So we sat down and talked about some of the organizational implica implications, how Dell is using AI internally and externally, what he's seeing, what Jeff Boudreau is seeing with regard to this role in other organizations in financial services and healthcare. So keep it right there. Dave Vellante, Rob Strecce, and John Ferry will be back. We'll watch this and we'll come back with our live program right after this conversation with Jeff Boudreau at Dell. Thanks for watching.